what is herd immunity? It's a concept that comes from modeling of infectious diseases, and it's the idea that at some point enough people have been infected or in the future vaccinated such that it's hard to have the virus continue transmitting through the community. It runs out of people that are susceptible. Now, the level at which you of cumulative infection or vaccination, the fraction of the people in those categories that has to occur in order to get herd immunity is a function both of the virus itself, in this case COVID, and the community that it's transmitting in. In a dense place like New York City with a lot of underground public transport, that level is going to be higher because the virus can transmit more easily. And in a rural place like Wyoming, that level will be much lower. Herd immunity is also being used right now by various uh, people in the public sphere, for example, the government of Sweden, as a strategy for dealing with COVID. And basically as a strategy, it means do nothing if you're the government, just let the virus run through the population, let it take its death toll, and then um, at some point, you'll reach uh, a point where there's no more people to be infected or to die. So it's really just letting the virus run as a strategy. Now, some people think there's a lot of people that are immune from uh, COVID-19 uh, because of past exposure to the common cold, many of which are caused by coronaviruses. In fact, there are claims out there that 80% of Americans and Europeans have that sort of immunity. And uh, we know that that can't be true. There's a number of, quote, natural experiments that tell us that a very small fraction, if any, have some sort of immunity. Uh, perhaps the most uh, direct is the Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier in the French Navy, where in a healthy young population, 70% of the sailors on that aircraft carrier uh, became infected. So clearly no background immunity because that's very close to the sort of uh, what you would have expected for herd immunity. And then we have communities where the fraction of the population that's been infected is really quite high. For example, Manaus, a city in the uh, state of Amazonas uh, in Brazil, it appears that 66% have already been infected. And we know that there's quite high infection rates uh, with still ongoing epidemics in places like Ecuador, Peru, and Mexico City, where more than 40% have already been infected and the epidemic is still uh, ongoing. Now, the other idea that's associated with herd immunity is that the peaks of transmission, the peaks of cases and deaths that occurred mostly in April in Europe and in New York in April, uh, were due to those communities reaching herd immunity. But that is simply just not the case. Uh, there's a much more direct and scientifically accurate explanation, namely the whole world, pretty much every country in the world except two, put on social distancing mandates in the last two weeks of March. And uh, about three to four weeks after putting social distancing mandates in place, we would expect and did observe a peak in cases and deaths. And in the Southern hemisphere, there were some large epidemics that occurred well later, May, June, and we believe that those epidemics occurred because of seasonality. That was their winter in the Southern Hemisphere. And that was enough to overcome the social distancing mandates that were in place in those places. Now we can look at the data for all the large epidemics and color the graphs by latitude. And when you do that and, and look at these curves where the x-axis is month of this year, you see a lot of northern hemisphere epidemics peaking in late March and in April. And then as we progress through uh, less and less uh, severe epidemics, you see that there's many epidemics in the sort of equatorial regions and in the Southern Hemisphere that take off late May, 
and reach a peak in June, July, and August. And it's really that pattern that where there was this delayed effect because those places put in place social distancing mandates when they really didn't have a large epidemic occurring. Again, it's just this sort of uh, clear evidence that what led to the peaks was not herd immunity. It was the imposition of mandates. If you put the mandates on when nothing much had yet had occurred, then you ended up with a smaller but delayed epidemic. Now, the other evidence that herd immunity wasn't the reason for the peaks is the places that we're seeing with multiple peaks. So take Serbia, uh, shown on this slide, where deaths in cases, there was a peak of deaths in April, uh, social distancing mandates brought the epidemic down, uh, the, the public became uh, less vigilant, and we had a second peak in July, August, and now that's come down as well. Take Iran, where the evidence is now entering their third peak that's starting to unfold. So you get this behavioral roller coaster where social distancing, distancing mandates led to reductions in transmission. People start interacting more, particularly young people in the case of Iran and a number of other countries. You get a huge explosion of cases and then deaths. It come then reimposition of mandates. People become more cautious. The epidemic comes down and that cycle repeats. What we're seeing now in France, and I'll show you Madrid in a moment, is a huge second surge. So clearly not at herd immunity and cases are really shooting up and deaths are starting to follow. And here's Madrid, the last example of this, where cases are now above where they were in April and deaths have started to follow the big uptick in cases. So clearly the peaks back in April were not due to reaching herd immunity. And as we'll talk in a later video, there is the winter surge coming driven largely by seasonality, but in part also by people becoming less vigilant. So question that lots of people have is, are there some communities that are close to herd immunity now? And despite just passing the grim milestone of a million deaths globally from COVID, we think very few populations are close to herd immunity. There's some perhaps neighborhoods in New York City that may be close to 65%. There's Manaus, as we already talked about. There are some uh, cities in Ecuador where that may also be uh, true. But given what we've seen in those places, given what we know about the potential to get up to 70% infected on the Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier, our best estimate of when herd immunity will actually kick in would be a, between 50% is the most optimistic view, uh, cumulative infection, and much more realistically, 65% of the population being infected. And if you look at this global map, which shows the estimate in, of the population that's infected today, you can see the highest rates are in Ecuador, parts of Brazil, in Peru, Mexico City, some other parts in Central America, where they are in 30 and as high as 40% infected, but not 65% at the, at the state or national level. So we have a very long distance to go in the epidemic before we get to herd immunity. On the way to herd immunity, if we don't get a vaccine, and we're all hopeful we will, but if we don't, we can calculate how many people would have to die if we end up at herd immunity through people being infected as opposed to vaccinated. And the way we can do that is that we have very good data now on the infection fatality rate by taking all these population-based antibody surveys, comparing it to the deaths in those communities, figuring out on an age-specific basis what is the fraction of people infected in each age group who would die from COVID, and then just uh, applying that to population age structure in each country. When you do that, you get these sort of numbers. Now, this is in the absence of vaccination or a breakthrough in treatment, both of which may well happen. In fact, we're, we're hopeful that they will sometime in 2021. But if not, 
if even in the most optimistic scenario around herd immunity, we would expect about 13 million deaths. We're at 1 million today, 13 million deaths globally, and 1 million deaths in the United States. So that, I, that way of thinking about herd immunity suggests that despite the horrific death toll already, the 200,000 plus deaths in the United States, the million deaths globally, we have a very long distance to go in, in the COVID-19 epidemic, unless we can get a vaccine out and unless there's a breakthrough in treatment. So what about a vaccine? Well, we know the fall winter surge has begun in Europe and we expect it to unfold in the US this month in October. Now an effective vaccine would make a really big difference and we are hopeful that the trials, uh, some of which should start to show results by the end of October or November, will tell us that there are effective RNA vaccines and then eventually protein vaccines. And the big issue will be both how effective are they and then how quickly can you scale up production? And everything we know from industry about the uh, speed of production strongly suggests that vaccination will have uh, no effect on the epidemic in this calendar year, maybe some effect in the United States in the first quarter of next year, and then likely a substantial effect in the US and in some other countries as well in the second quarter of 2021. So for now, our best strategy is to focus on the things we know work and we've seen them work over and over when people are careful, they stay six feet away from others and they wear a mask. And that can make a really profound impact on the death toll we will see in the world. So to conclude, Herd immunity is when enough people have either been infected or vaccinated that it's going to stop the transmission of the virus. As a strategy, it simply means letting an awful lot of people die because we let the virus spread through the whole population. It's not really a strategy at all. We have not reached, nor are we close to reaching herd immunity in the US or Europe. And vaccines will hold the potential to bring about herd immunity without so many deaths in 2021. We plan to incorporate vaccination into our model results because we think they'll make a difference um, in, by the end of October. So for our November releases of the modeling, we will uh, reflect our expectation of vaccination coverage. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, the key recommendation is to wear a mask and socially distance wherever possible. Thank you very much.